Uh, Colonel McGregor joins us now. Colonel, uh, always a pleasure. Thank you for uh, joining us. What, what is your uh, latest uh, view from open sources and from your own sources about the cause of the explosion in the dam and uh, in eastern Ukraine about 10 days ago? And who suffered more because of it, uh, the Russians or the Ukrainians? Well, the consensus appears to be that the Ukrainians did it. Uh, and I'm told that it actually was approved, if you will, for demolition by Victoria Newland, oh. which is kind of interesting. Uh, I don't know. Uh, and again, you know, you, you have the intelligence officers. I think they've probably said something similar. Yes, but as they far have. As, but as, as far as who benefits, well, the Ukrainians certainly did not benefit from this at all. But I think it probably assisted the Russians because it, it, it created a situation where they had less to defend, obviously, and their left flank was effectively invulnerable to amphibious assault, even though I think that probably would have resulted in still more Ukrainian casualties. Would something of this magnitude, uh, I guess, if, if, if Victoria Newland was involved, I was going to ask you if Washington approved, that, that answers that question, if she was involved. Washington would approve of something like this. Does she, who is not a military person, get in, as far as you know, get involved in the minutia uh, of uh, military strategy? I, I have no way of knowing that, Judge. Uh, I'm just telling you what I was told by the sources that I trust. And it seems reasonable that if you're going to take a big action, any sort of big action, you're going to send uh, your special operations forces into Russia try to assassinate someone, fly drones into the Kremlin or something, you're probably going to ask your sponsors in Washington, what do you think? And that means that she's going to be involved. She's been involved in everything happening in Ukraine, really, I would say now for at least 14, 15 years, if not longer. The uh, spring offensive is becoming a summer offensive. Uh, what is your take? What is your understanding of its success or its failures thus far uh, and its likely um, uh, progression from this time forward? You know, there, there are a lot of interesting reports out there. And if you, if you have time, and I don't think most people do, you begin to look at these reports of Ukrainian gains. You discover that in many cases, the areas where they are claiming that they made gains are nowhere near the battlefield. They're not even in the security zone. And a few times they'll point to some ruined buildings, two or three at a time inside the security zone. And that's this 15 to 25 kilometer stretch of territory beyond the main defensive belt that the Russians have constructed. So I would tell you there'd be no gains at all because everything always hinged on the ability of the Ukrainian counteroffensive to reach the main defensive belt, crack it, move through it in order to reach something of importance like Melitopol. It hasn't happened. And we're now at least 11 days uh, into what the Ukrainians said would be a two-week offensive. How much they've got left is anybody's guess. The last time I looked, there were supposedly still 12 brigades in reserve. Now, are those full-strength brigades? Or, you know, conceivably that could be 60,000 men if they're up to 5,000 each. Or are they 4,000? Are they 3,000, 2,000? I don't know. But at this stage of the game, they, they have not yet committed those last remaining reserves. Would those last remaining reserves be the last remaining reserves, period, for the duration of the war or, or just for this offensive? But 60,000 men doesn't sound like a lot to me when you consider what Putin has. Well, I'm told uh, the likely number is closer to thirty-five to 40,000. I don't think there's much left, frankly. And I think that's reflected in the headlines that you're getting out of Washington right now. The discussions about, as we talked last time, frozen conflict, setting up some sort of halfway house. Washington knows that Ukraine is close to collapse. It very definitely is. The, the, the country is destroyed. The military is, has been weakened beyond imagination. You're talking about people that are being thrown into action without adequate artillery support, without adequate protection in the air and missile defense category. So when you don't have those kinds of protections and you send in troops, many of whom are, are green or inexperienced, 
you see one catastrophe after the next. And at the same time, as, as we pointed out before, the Russians have now become much, much better than they were a year and a half ago. I think they're probably the best army in the world at this point. They're very competent, very well organized. They're now able to mine uh, behind advancing Ukrainian troops by air delivery of mines from helicopters, wow. from artillery. Uh, th- this thing has gone very badly for the Ukrainians. We don't know how many people they've lost, and they're not going to tell us the truth, Judge. And I've never heard of this before, so forgive my ignorance. What is an air-delivered mine? Is that a mine that sort of self-digs? No, it's it, these are mines that can be delivered from from an airplane, from, uh, you know, a... Uh, a helicopter. I think the Russians like to use helicopters at low altitude flying. And of course, you could also deliver them from artillery. We have artillery delivered mines. However, these mines are self-actuating. In other words, they hit the ground in a certain pattern, which is designed in advance. Then they activate. Now, that means that you can see them, but that doesn't make much difference if they're all around you. <laughs> Right, right, right. What difference does it make? You still have to go through the mines and, and breaching. I, I actually ran over a mine in my M1A1 tank in 1991 and it rocked the 70 ton tank. Fortunately for me, it was a Chinese box mine and the blast was uh, not as intended. And that was because it had a tilt rod on it. It had been in the desert so long, mm. the fans had shifted. So the blast was up but away from the tank. So it blew mm. off most of my right track. But the point is that, you know, when you've got tens of thousands of these, and they're potentially a million plus mines in front of these defenses, once you're in it, then you, then you discover there's no way out of it. You try to turn around and get out of it, and you run into mines behind you that weren't there when you started. This is catastrophic. Uh, here's uh, Yevgeny uh, Prigozhin. It's rather... Uh, measured talk by his standards, um, uh, analyzing his or explaining his view of the success or lack thereof of the Ukrainians and their offensive. It's in Russian with subtitles, so for the benefit of our friends who are listening as opposed to watching this show, uh, I will read the subtitles aloud. Words, what's happening? The following is happening. Ukrainians began an offensive. I'm saying all of this with the offensive. They do everything competently. They're cutting off certain areas in the Zaporizhia direction. They're moving carefully, calmly. They lost a couple of Leopards and Bradleys. These are normal combat losses. I'm not saying this to promote them, but to judge sensibly. For now, in my view, and according to the valuation of the military on the ground, not enough is being done to counter the enemy. Pretty optim, uh, pretty pessimistic on his part, no? Uh, again, you know, Prigozhin is an interesting character. I think he has aspirations that are political in nature. I also think he's close to Putin. And if he says something like this, uh, I'm sure that Putin is, uh, has approved it. Putin just spoke the other day, Judge. I don't know if you've read his remarks in English. Oh, I, I, I have. We have some, some clips of it for you. He was, uh, Nothing short of brilliant in, in, in some of his analyses, but you know this far better than I, uh, Colonel. Uh, here, uh, here he is, um, uh, with some, some, uh, a remarkable candor is the way I'll describe it. And again, I'll read the subtitles. <laughs> During this time, and they've lost over 160 tanks, over 300, 460 armored vehicles of various types. This is just what we see. There are still losses that we do not see that are inflicted. The Russian Federation has also been using high-precision weapons, attack large concentrations, so there are actually more of these losses on the Ukrainian side. And so by my calculations, it's about 25, maybe 30 percent. 
of the volume of equipment that was supplied from abroad. Here's about, it seems to me, that if they can't objectively, they'll go along with it. But as far as I've seen from open sources, from Western sources, that's about what they seem to be saying. Here. So the offensive is on. These are the results to date of what I just said. Now, this is part of a three and a half hour interview, as you know, because you've read the transcript, or maybe you read it in the original uh, Russian, as our friend, no, no, no. Our, our friend Ray McGovern did. But, well, but God bless you. Ray, <laughs> Ray, Ray sent me a tape of him getting arrested in the Senate the other day. It was quite a Quite a hoot. We'll, we'll talk about that some other time. But be that as it may, mm. I, I thought President Putin was uh, remarkable. I can't imagine Joe Biden sitting down with America's leading journalists for three and a half hours. But be that as it may, what did you think about what he said on that clip? I think he gave you an accurate picture because that's largely what we're hearing. <clears throat> if anything, he understated the damage. Uh, and that's probably a good thing for him to do as the president of Russia. The point he's trying to make is it's not over. And everything that he says subsequent to his discussion of the battle damage, which has been serious, it revolves around how much more of this do we have to destroy? Then we need to take stock of what we've destroyed. And based on that, we'll then consider what we want to do next. I mean, it's very obvious to me that from the beginning, he's always wanted to spare his troops unnecessary casualties. He's also been interested in avoiding unnecessary collateral damage. And he would like to have a settlement without pushing this to the very nth degree, if you will. But I think he knows that uh, he's going to get, you're going to reach a point where they've destroyed so much. It doesn't make sense to sit still anymore. You might as well attack because there won't be any negotiation and get this over with. I think he's nearing that decision point but not until he's convinced this offensive is over and he wants to see an accurate picture of just how much is being destroyed. 